Hi, I'm Belinda Carley, the Director of the Institute of Personal Care Science. And today I'm going to take you through the five big formulation mistakes that a lot of learners make when they first start formulating cosmetics. The first mistake I want to take you through is the wrong preservative selection. So first of all, you need to make sure you're always picking a broad spectrum preservative or a combination of preservatives that provide broad spectrum activity. That's protection against bacteria, yeast and mold. Now that's often not the biggest problem. The biggest mistake they make is that when they make their preservative selection, they may use the wrong amount. Now, a lot of times people think 1% of preservative is what gets used. That's not necessarily the case. Different preservatives have different inputs that are required. But even more importantly, you need to make sure you're using the preservative at the right pH for its activity. So there are a lot of natural preservatives out there, for example, that require a pH to be quite acidic, around five to be effective. So if you use the wrong preservative in a higher pH environment, it simply won't work. So you need to make sure that you check for the pH requirement or the pH activity that the preservative has and use it in a formula at that pH or a little below so it always stays in that range over the entire shelf life of the product. If the pH moves over time, and it will, you need to make sure that that preservative is still going to be effective. So double check the pH activity of the preservative or preservatives you select. Don't under preserve, don't over preserve. Make sure you use the right input for the preservative that you select as well. The second biggest mistake I see formulators make is that they don't process their materials properly. And one of the material categories where they often don't process correctly is when using certain gums and polymers. Different gums and polymers all have different processing requirements. Natural gums need a slurry, for example. Guar derivatives need to be acidified. Cellulose derivatives need to be alkalized and a lot of polymers can't handle medium or high shear and usually need to be neutralized with no final adjustment once they've been neutralized properly. So make sure you pick your gum or polymer carefully to suit the environment of the formula you're going to use it and make sure you process it properly to the needs of the gum or polymer you've selected. Another mistake I see a lot of early formulators make is with their emulsifier choices. Emulsifiers is a very big topic, but in a nutshell, there's certain types of emulsifiers that help us create oil in water emulsions. And there's a lot of emulsifiers that help us create water in oil emulsions. So you need to make sure you're picking the right type of emulsifier, depending on which type of emulsion you're trying to create. Another thing to remember is that when you have blends of emulsifiers, they will pack denser at the interface between the water and the oil, which will give you a more stable product. That's why we use blended materials or more than one type of emulsifier in most of our formulation types. And just remember that your ionic emulsifiers don't work too well when you introduce a lot of electrolytes or charge to a formula because they use charge repulsion to stabilize a formula. So if you're gonna be using a lot of actives with a lot of charge in your formula or extreme pH conditions, ionic emulsifiers are not normally a very good choice. But your non-ionic materials, blended especially, are great choices to stabilize your formulas depending on your selections, whether it be water and oil or oil and water. So there's a couple of tips to help you with selection, but it is a very big topic and it's really important you make the right emulsifier choices for the type of product you're trying to create. Another error I see a lot of beginner formulators make is not using an active the way it needs to be used. So there are all sorts of active ingredients out there and there's all sorts of inputs they need to be used at. It's not correct to think that 1% or 5% or the more you use is better. You actually need to look at the efficacy data of the active to determine how much was proven through human trials to get the result you're looking for. 
We can look at it in vitro testing, but that's not on humans. In vivo testing helps us see the best input to be used to get the required performance from human studies. So look for in vivo efficacy data and the amount of active that was used to get the desired result and use that amount of active in your formula to get the same result. Another thing you have to be really careful of is making sure that the finished product pH suits the active you've chosen. Some actives can't be used in certain pH conditions and it varies. So you'll need to get supplier data and check for that carefully too. Make sure you're using the active ingredient at a pH that is compatible with that active ingredient, otherwise it simply won't work. So if you've been using an active and aren't getting the results you've been hoping for, check your input against in vivo efficacy data and check the pH and other ingredients you've used in the formula to make sure that they're compatible with the active you've chosen and that way you can get the best results out of your active selection. Finally, number five. I see a lot of misinformation and confusion about the choice of antioxidants in formulas. Just remember, there are antioxidants that will provide an antioxidant benefit for the skin, but won't help the formula. And there's antioxidants that will help protect your formula and give it a good shelf life. And usually they will also benefit the skin. If you are trying to select an antioxidant to protect your formula, make sure you're selecting an antioxidant that will provide that benefit for the formula. Just because it's an antioxidant for the skin does not mean it will give any benefit to the formula. In fact, there's a lot of oils and extracts out there that are great as antioxidants for the skin, but do nothing about protecting your formula. Your vitamin E choices and rosemary extract, the resinous kind, are usually the best natural antioxidant sources for your formula. And just a common misconception out there, vitamin E acetate will do nothing to protect your formula. It's good for the skin, but it won't protect your formula. So if you wanna protect your formula against oxidation, make sure you're selecting an antioxidant that will protect your formula, not just the skin. I've run through some of the most common mistakes that beginner formulators make when putting together their formulas and I hope it's been a good help for you already. Remember, if you want to learn more, we're here to help. But hopefully already in this video, you've seen several tips to help you make some better selections and maybe identify where you might have gone wrong in previous formulation mistakes. Another thing I want to point out is that when you get in the lab, they're called samples for a reason. They're not called perfects. It usually takes at least a few attempts at making your sample in the lab when you've made good material choices and thought about extra compatibility requirements and the finished product pH to get it just right. So don't expect it to be a perfect first time. You're simply making a sample. And I don't know about you, but my time in the lab is some of the best parts of my day. I hope you've got a lot out of this video. Please give it a thumbs up. Please leave any questions or comments below and make sure you subscribe to receive notifications about all our videos. Happy formulating.